by recognizing Jerusalem and moving our embassy there, uh, our country is saying what we know from history and the Bible that Jerusalem has actually been the capital of Jerusalem for 3,000, or uh, capital Israel. of Israel for 3,000 years. And here's why that is so significant. That historical truth that Jerusalem has been the capital for 3,000 years absolutely explodes the myth that comes from the left that somehow the Jewish people just came into that land 70 years ago and they took it away from the Palestinians and that the Jews have no rightful claim to it. The Bible says and history confirms that God gave that land to the Jewish people and I believe as G Genesis 12 says God blesses those countries that bless Israel and he curses those countries countries that curse Israel. I believe President Trump and the United States are not only on the right side of history in this decision, they're on the right side of God. And here it is, the Balfour Declaration. What do you feel when you, when you see it here? I genuinely feel it's one of the most extraordinary moments in the history of the Jewish people. If you think it took 3,000 years uh, to get to this, and then you say, how did this miracle happen? It's the most incredible piece of opportunism. I mean, if you think you had an impoverished uh, would-be scientist, Heim Weizmann, who somehow gets to England, meets a few people, including members of my family, seduces them, he has such great charm and conviction. He gets to Balfour, and he unbelievably persuades Balfour and Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, and most of the ministers, that this idea of um, the national home for um, Jews should be allowed to take place. I mean, it's so, so unlikely. You come back to the big point, which is that this is perhaps the greatest event in Jewish life for thousands of years. And um, it's a miracle that it took place. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg Juggler 66 Hour of the Truth. Today, once again, as you know, in co collaboration with my brother in Christ, Tom Fress, over there, a few thousand miles away in the United States of America, but very close to me, connected via the wonderful technical invention Internet and Skype. This is that we can have a conversation as if we were sitting next to me or was sitting next to me, which I would very much appreciate if it ever happened. But for the moment, we are connected like this, and we are going to continue in our study today, the 73rd part of the study of the end time delusions by Steve Wahlberg and the uh, detailed part um, exploding the Israel deception, which already took us some parts and is still going to take us some parts to go through. And Tom and I just spoke about this before the camera uh, started to run, that this is probably the most important recording uh, we will ever do. And I'm not speaking about this particular part, but I'm speaking about this particular series, Exploding the Israel Deception, telling the world what impact futurism has on the, on the whole world, not only on the spiritual world, not only on the church world, but also on the world out there, even the material world, the temporal world, everybody out there. We are all living a lie. And this lie is only possible because the futurist lie, the religious futurist lie of an unfulfilled 70th week of Daniel is upheld. That's why the world looks today what it looks like, because that's the epitome of Satan's deception. That's what it's really all about. He wants everybody to accept another Christ. And that other Christ is nobody else but the biblical, historical and prophetic Antichrist, the Vicarius Filii Dei, the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church, the harlot, the daughter of, uh, not the daughter, the mother of harlots, 
the whore of Babylon. That's the way I, I wanted to say that. For, forgive me if I'm uh, not on my top game uh, today. That can happen. I, I didn't sleep very well the last few nights. But uh, anyway, um, the point is that um, it's all coming to an end. Um, Satan's deception is coming to an end. Uh, this world is coming to an end because Jesus Christ is coming back. I'm not saying that he is coming back today or that he is coming back tomorrow. I'm not saying anyway when he is coming, but I'm telling you that the time goes nearer and near, comes closer and closer when he comes back. It's evident in the world. And the world can only survive until Jesus Christ comes back if the lie is upheld. And the lie is that there will be a future Jesus Christ that Jesus Christ, who was 2,000 years ago, was not the real Christ. And that's all of the deception of the futurist world we live in. And the whole world is directed into that lie. That's why there is a nation state of Israel for crying out loud. That's why every nation in the world accepts that nation state of Israel. They are all in the game. They are all conspired against the God of the Bible, against our Elohim against our Holy Father who is in heaven and against our Jesus Christ who sits next to him in heaven. That's the point to, 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 to uh, you know, in a few words to, to try to sum up the whole history of the world. Yeah? Man has become disobedient to his father. He became obedient to Satan and now Satan has the power, authority and dominion to take over the whole world and lead it the way that he wants to, so that he is being worshipped, read Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 15, to understand the rebellion of Lucifer in heaven. Um, and when Lucifer was thrown out of heaven, he became Satan, who is on the earth today, and he has the power to do what he does, because God has given him the power, because people have turned their backs to God anyway. Even the so-called Christians... Yeah, I say so-called Christians because they profess Jesus Christ out of one side of their mouth and deny him out of the other because they do not believe, they do not understand, they do not profess that Jesus Christ fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel. Now, you can say, but Jörg, the Bible is, contains many more prophecies of Jesus Christ, and many more things of, uh, are important, but in Daniel chapter 9 only. That's true. There were many other prophecies, especially, for example, what was it, uh, Isaiah 53, the quote-unquote forgotten, ch forgotten chapter that you can find on the internet that also speaks about uh, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was prophesied already in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. It is not only Daniel that speaks about it, but Daniel gave the absolute to the nanosecond correct timeline when Jesus Christ would come so that everybody being living at that moment would know that Jesus Christ came and the time. But what did Jesus Christ say or what does the Bible say? They did not know the time of their visitation. Well, that was a very long introduction for me speaking, but I die for getting Tom to the mic and he can even fulfill this a little bit more, complete this a little bit more, what I just started. Welcome to the broadcast, Tom. Glad to have you. Yes, very happy to be here and blessed, and it's a privilege. And uh, I hope the listeners will indulge us because there's more to be said about this. The very prophecy that the Jews rejected, the Jews did not understand, is the very prophecy that caused them uh, not to know the time of their visitation. It's like Yerk said to the listeners, uh, Daniel's prophecy in chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, called the 70th week of Daniel, is literally Daniel or the angel Gabriel who gave him this, who gave him this prophecy, is literally placing a red X on the calendar uh, 483 years in the future when Jesus Messiah the Prince, the Prince that shall come, would literally be found in Jerusalem. Okay? He said there would be seven weeks and 62 weeks, altogether making 69 weeks 
And at the end of that 69th week, the very beginning of the 70th week, is when Jesus would offer to the Jews and to Jerusalem the covenant in his blood. And in the midst of the week, in the midst of that last seven-year period of time, he would cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease by becoming the lamb himself that taketh away the sin of the world and therefore putting an end, a permanent end to every and any sacrifice. The sacrifice to end all sacrifices. The blood that the, and the only blood that can take away sin was Jesus' blood. Okay? Then for the remaining three and a half years, the gospel continued to be preached to the Jews and to Jerusalem until finally they received their last witness by Stephen, a prophet Stephen offering one last time the covenant in Jesus' blood, confirmation that sin had been dealt with permanently. And what did they do? Knowing not the time of their visitation, knowing not about the 70th week of Daniel and that Messiah the Prince would be among them, they denied that Jesus was the Messiah. They rejected his gospel. They rejected his atonement. They rejected his salvation, and they stoned Stephen to shut him up. They knew not the time of their visitation. And yet here we are, a little over 2,000, about 2,000 years later, nearing 2,000 years later, and this self-same prophecy that the Jews and Jerusalem were ignorant of that caused them to miss their Messiah is the same prophecy that has deluded the entire Christian world. And I'm speaking the entire Christian world. And we are just as guilty of not knowing as were the Jews 2,000 years ago. And it cost them dearly 2,000 years ago for not knowing the time of their visitation, not knowing Daniel's 70-week prophecy. They missed their Messiah. Now, what are the consequences for our generation? They will receive a false Messiah. And, it, and, and it, all, it all boils down to, do you know and understand Daniel's prophecy? If you do, you will not be deceived. If you don't, you will be deceived. And you can walk the streets of this country. You can walk the streets of Jerusalem. You can walk the streets of Europe and ask anybody who the Antichrist is. They can't tell you. You ask them, you ask them uh, who the Antichrist is, and they will not know. But those who understand Daniel's prophecy are not looking for a future Antichrist. We're looking for the here and now Antichrist. We're looking for the historical Antichrist because there's going to be no future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. It was fulfilled perfectly and completely, every jot and every tittle of it, by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. But the whole Christian world today believes in a future fulfillment and that it's going to be fulfilled by the Antichrist. And since it hasn't been fulfilled yet, they don't know who the Antichrist is. But those of us who know that the, de that the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled by Jesus 2,000 years ago, we've always known who the Antichrist is. He was, he was revealed to the world just as soon as the restrainer was taken out of the way. That which was re 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 restraining the Antichrist's rise to power which was the Roman government. And when the pagan Roman Caesars were taken out of the way, the so-called fall of the Roman Empire, what stood up in its place, the power vacuum left behind by the Caesars was the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn, the Antichrist, the beast, 
the one who deceives the whole world, the one who persecute, persecutes the saints of the Most High, wears out the saints of the Most High, thinks to change times and laws, the papacy. What you just said, nope. Tom, what you just said, Tom, about the, the quote-unquote fall, the so-called fall of the Roman Empire and the rise of the papacy, that is what Revelation 13 really deals with. And that That's is right. something that will be part of one of our future studies. And I, I just That's want right. to announce that, Tom. We have been working for months already with Brother Robert in a weekly study on Tuesday to get a pure understanding of the Bible without being church glassed in our understanding. And we finally see how deep the deception really goes. I don't yeah. say even that we, that we see it for 100%, but I say that we saw it up to the study that we went to maybe for 50%. Now we see it at least for 90%. And these yeah. missing 40% is something that will come up as soon as we probably uh, finished the reading of this book and the study of this book, Exploding the Israel Deception, the next study will busy itself with a true interpretation of the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation and how it all works together. Yeah. I'm sorry I had to interrupt you here, Tom, but no. I, you really gave me the stop word to say, well, when the Roman Empire seemingly fell yeah. and the papal Roman Empire came out of the pagan Roman Empire, that is a very little discussed Yes. A historical fact in the world yes. and that needs to be discussed more because there is already a, a, a huge, a gigantic deception in there in That's the right. world and we need to address it That's and right. we will do and that in the future. We're trying to iron out our differences. What Yerk is trying to tell the listeners is this. Uh, since futurism is the only thing that's ever been taught in the churches in our generation, we have we have been taught a futurist interpretation of the book of revelation we have been taught out of the book of revelation things that support futurism which we know now is a lie a damnable lie a laughable lie that no one should have ever believed in so we know we need to be corrected in our understanding of the book of revelation and we've sought help to understand correctly the book of Revelation that fits the historicist interpretation of Daniel's prophecy. And it's huge. And uh, uh, we, we're not deluded into thinking that we know all there is to know about this. Our understanding of the book of Revelation has to change. And I think it's going to be a revelation that will liberate the spirits and the souls of a lot of people who are bound up in their futurist delusion and cannot let it go because, the, because they've been taught out of the book of Revelation things that seem to support the futurist interpretation of Daniel's prophecy. Listen, the listeners here now, by now, they know futurism is a lie. Historicism is the only thing that makes sense. It makes biblical sense, it makes scriptural sense, it makes prophetic sense, and it makes common sense. There's no, there's no bad sense about it. And it, it the, the truth is so palpable as to be undeniable. And uh, so now we need a re-education re in, the, in, the, in the book of Revelation. <clears throat> and we're going to have it. We're going to pray for it. We're going to seek it. We're going to ask for it, pray for it. And we're going to work diligently until we solve it and we're going to put futurism on the run it's going to be put on trial and every eye is going to see every ear is going to hear and everybody's going to reject futurism for the diabolical lie that it is and uh, <clears throat> we know that's the truth and uh, the listeners need to keep their eyes and their ears peeled and, and, and wait for uh, a little more time for us to work it out. Now, it's 
very important to understand that Matthew Henry was just one of the Protestant expositors of the scriptures and his commentary on the book of Daniel, particularly Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, support our thesis and give proof to the listener that they can research for themselves. They don't have to take our words for it. Matthew Henry had never heard of futurism. Matthew Henry had only ever been taught the historical fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy in Jesus Christ. And that understanding was had by all true Christians in his generation all the way back to the first century church. And likewise, because they had this historical fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week in Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago, then they knew that uh, Christ could not come, could not return until the man of sin was revealed. And so they looked immediately, even the first century Christians looked for the revelation of the Antichrist. They knew he was coming. They knew that just as Jesus was the Christ, the Antichrist was soon to be revealed. But the restrainer had first to be taken out of the way, okay? The Roman Empire had to be taken out of the way first. And this is why they had to be so careful about what they said, because they, they were literally preaching the fall of the Roman government. That could get you, you know, crucified in that day and age. To be talking about an overthrow of the Roman government, that's why Paul was so cryptic in his letter to the Thessalonians. Remember when I was with you, I told you these things, he said. He couldn't write it in the letter in case it fell into the wrong hands. What, what Paul told the Thessalonians was that the Roman government was going to be toppled. The Roman government was going to be taken out of the way, and a new Roman government would come up in its place. Daniel called it the little horn. Others called it the beast. Others called it the Antichrist. Others called it the man of sin. Paul, John, and Daniel all foresaw it and all predicted it and all identified it. And all of Christianity was simply waiting for it to happen. And they knew that Christ could not return until he was take, until the Antichrist was revealed. And so they looked for him to come, and he did, right on time. And it's been in the world ever since, uh, like the fifth century, the papacy is the, is the power that ruled over the Roman Empire. It's why it's called the Holy Roman Empire. Before, under the Caesars, it was regarded as the pagan Roman Empire. Now it's different than any other empire of the Gentiles ever to come about. It's, it's, it's diverse from all other empires of the Gentiles and it is called the Holy Roman Empire, when in fact, it is the empire of the Antichrist. <clears throat> and <clears throat> the papacy for the last 1,500 years has been fulfilling all of the prophecies of Daniel, of, of, of John, and of Paul throughout the entire Christian era. And it was at the time of the Protestant Reformation when Martin Luther and the other Protestant reformers who had, were formerly Roman Catholic and worshiped the Pope like a god, they came out of the Roman Catholic Church in protest, claiming the papacy to be the Antichrist. And what they also claimed was that the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled in Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. But... Uh, uh, and that's what we should believe. We should believe the same thing that every Christian from the first century church all the way to the Protestant Reformation believed, that Jesus is the Christ and the papacy is the Antichrist. That's true biblical Christianity. That's historical Christianity. That is the foundation 
of true biblical prophetic Christianity, that Jesus is the Christ. How do we know? Because he fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel. Okay? He, he, he made a covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week, he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. Okay? That's how we know Jesus is the Christ. He fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel. If Jesus didn't fulfill the 70th week of Daniel, then Jesus cannot be the Christ. You see what they've done to you? Do you still trust the churches? Do you still trust the pastors? How is it that you believe so much differently than every Christian prior to the Protestant Reformation? Could they have all been wrong? You know, many people like to den denigrate me by saying, Tom, you, you think you're the only one that's right and everybody else is wrong. No, the futurists think they're right and every Christian prior to the Protestant Reformation was wrong. Now, which do you believe is more likely? Tom just believes what every Christian believed prior to the Protestant Reformation. I'm in the extreme vast majority of historical Christianity. I believe the same thing, that Jesus fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel. Therefore, he is the Christ. And we know because the New Testament is the divine and infallible witness of Jesus's fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. And we also know that the papacy is the Antichrist. And that's why the saints of Almighty God for the last 1,500 years have been persecuted, because they said the same thing that I say. The papacy is the Antichrist. So the papacy and the kings of the earth sought the saints to kill them, to shut them up, just like the Jews stoned Stephen to shut him up. We still witness the covenant that Jesus made for one week. We still, we still uh, advocate that Jesus caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease, that the mass is an abomination where Roman Catholics eat and drink damnation to themselves. And for all intents and purposes, all the Protestant and evangelical churches, which are now being taught, that the communion table is indeed a sacrifice, they too will eat and drink damnation to themselves. And what do you think they're going to do to us? The same thing the Antichrist has always done, kill the saints, wear out the saints of the Most High. And our blood will be mingled with all the, all the martyrs of Jesus throughout the entire Christian history. But does that shut us up? No more than stones could shut up Stephen. And so we boldly go where no man dares to go, straight to the truth. Jesus is the Christ. The papacy is the Antichrist. Jesus is the historical fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. That's how we know he is the Messiah. That's why we can read and understand the New Testament, because it is the perfect divine and infallible witness of God that Jesus fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel. That's why the whole New Testament was written. We don't question it. We dare not question it. But all of Christianity questions it. They say the 70th week of Daniel is yet future. How can that be? How can it be? But it is. And you, now you know why <clears throat> I tell God's people, get out of the churches. For the love of Christ, get out of the churches and embrace the truth, the historicist truth. Do not be deceived by the greatest of all delusions since the Garden of Eden. And Steve Wolberg understands this. That's why he wrote this book. And that's why we're reading it and discussing it. And... Uh, it's got to be a blessing to anybody that hears it. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. I think that was a great inauguration of today's reading that we planned so far and that we will continue in right now. 
So, we are on page 45 in the PDF of the book on point 6 in the subject, in, in the uh, subchapter, the 70th week of Daniel delusion. Uh, point 6 of what? Well, again, the following 10 points provide logical and convincing evidence that the one week spoken of in Daniel 9.27 does not apply to any future seven-year period of tribulation at all. Rather, this great prophetic period has already been definitely fulfilled in the past. We went through the first five points, including a lengthy comment of mine last week, and now we are going to continue in point six. He shall confirm the covenant. Jesus Christ came to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. In Romans chapter 15, verse 8, we read, Now I say, Paul speaking, that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Nowhere in the Bible is Antichrist ever said to make or confirm a covenant with anyone. The word covenant always applies to the Messiah, never ever to the Antichrist. I dare you, church your Bible, search for the word covenant and see if it is in any context to the Antichrist wherever it pops up. You will not find that. By the way, if you want to, Tom, we can even go and do that. I have the Bible here. I take the standard because of the writing. Covenant. Huh? I'm not seeing your screen, but go ahead. The listeners will see it. Oh, you're not seeing my screen? No. Oh, then something went wrong. Then let me just... Yeah. Don't, okay. don't be labor it. Just concentrate on the listeners well, that's it's okay I'm, I'm just i'm just stopping it and uh, sharing oh, it again there it and, comes. and now okay, you should there see it, it. Comes. okay yeah i'm seeing it now so covenant just let's look where the bible speaks of the word covenant nevertheless i will remember my covenant with thee in the in the days of thy youth and i will establish unto thee an everlasting covenant uh, let me just enlarge that a little bit then it's easier for tom to read huh we're just searching yes. the word covenant in the King James Bible. Genesis chapter 17, verse 13. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. In the book of Leviticus, in 2 Kings, in Deuteronomy, in Jeremiah chapter 20, 33, Jeremiah 31, Genesis 17, 19, 1 Samuel, Hebrews. For example, let's take this. This is of the New Testament, of course. People are most of the times more interested in the New Covenant than in the Old, so the New Testament. It says in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 9, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. There is not one example in the whole Bible. We could go on and on and on to see if anything of the covenant has to do with any Antichrist. You see, it's 10 pages, yeah? and you see how big these pages are, but I just leave it here with Hebrews 8, 9. I think, Tom, this is a good example, right? That exactly well, makes the point that we are making here all the time. Huh? Well, absolutely, certainly. And uh, why, does, why do all the churches say that the Antichrist is going to confirm a covenant with many for one week? Why? And how do they get by with it? How do God's people go to the churches and allow that lying sinner behind the pulpit tell them that the Antichrist is going to make a seven-year peace treaty or a covenant with the Jews? Why do we let them get by with such twisting of the Scripture? We're taught to respect these people, but I have no respect for them. They don't deserve to be respected. <laughs> They deserve to be driven out of the churches with whips and chains like dogs. They deserve to bounce off the curb in the streets 
in front of the churches. They deserve to be put into a soup line. Every one of them are lying dogs. Every one of them. Without exception that I know of. Anyone who teaches that the Antichrist confirms a covenant with many for one week is a lying dog and deserves not to stand anywhere in the churches. Have I made it clear? And I think it's time for God's people to stand up and hound them and drown them out of the churches. They're liars. Every single one of them. It was Jesus who made covenant. It was God who made covenant. He's the only one who is authorized to make a covenant with God's people or anyone else. Do you realize that the papacy, the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, has no legitimate place or authority in this world? The Bible tells us that the dragon gave him his seat and power and great authority. Are we to respect that? God's people? It is the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the papacy, who is the, the God of the futurist pastors behind the pulpits. Because the pastors are repeating papal lies. Futurism was derived from the papacy. It is the master stroke of genius in the Jesuit-led Counter-Reformation to destroy biblical Christianity. Now do you see the pastors in the correct light? Now is it clear in your mind what our position should be toward them? Opposition. Staunch opposition. As much as we should oppose Satan, we should oppose these futurist pastors. And take back the churches. Either take them back or abandon them altogether. And I suggest we let them have the churches. As long as we've got Christ, we are the church. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. That was a little, not planned, but necessary, um, little travel we, we did there to understand this point six. Again, nowhere in the Bible is Antichrist ever said to make a, or confirm a covenant with anyone. The word covenant always applies to the Messiah, never to the Antichrist. And I think since this point is clear, you have no foundable reason to stand on when you defend futurism when you defend another interpretation but the historical and the biblical one of Daniel chapter 9. Point 7. He shall confirm the covenant with many, Jesus said. This is my blood of the New Testament which is shed for many. Jesus said that in Matthew chapter 26 verse 28. This is my blood of the New Testament, the New Covenant, which is shed for many. He shall confirm the covenant with many. Jesus used the same words because he knew that he was fulfilling Daniel 9, 27. Did you read that again? Did you listen to that? Jesus used the very words in Daniel's prophecy. There should be no mistake whatsoever. Jesus was literally in this fashion proving himself to be the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. That's why he came, to fulfill Daniel's prophecy. And therefore, 
he used the very words that the angel Gabriel gave to Daniel to describe what the Messiah would do. He did that on more than one occasion, and we spoke oh, already about yes. that in another video. But yes. it is always important to repeat that uh, that uh, that fact, Tom. Absolutely. Now I'm I'm interested to see what kind of a comment I put in here because it's time a long time ago that I wrote this. So even more important, I find a point that is often, if not always, overlooked in this regard. Read Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Now in Daniel chapter 9 verse 24 states, quote, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity. Isn't then this part of Jesus' answer in Matthew 18 the perfect fulfillment of Jesus Christ fulfilling the complete prophecy of Daniel chapter 9? Well, we already did a at least one, if not more than one, broadcast on Matthew 18:21. But in the time when I prepared this book, I found that so important to state that there is more than one uh, part in the Bible where we can see that Jesus is actually using the words used in um, in the Old Testament in Daniel when he speaks in the New Testament. He shall confirm the covenant means the New Testament with many. Yeah? The covenant you can replace it by the New Testament. I think there is nobody who is going to argue with that because he makes a new covenant with us. We just read that in Hebrews chapter 8. Yeah? For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 7 through 10. Very important part. And as we said, uh, Tom and I are probably going to do a study of the whole book of Hebrews uh, in the future and put that out uh, on videos as this, because it is so important for a correct understanding. So here we have another point, because there are many more points, where Jesus Christ confirms in his own words what was spoken of 500 years before in the book of Daniel, and he confirms word for word that he is the fulfillment of Daniel 70's week. Jesus used the same words here, Steve Wahlberg says, because he knew he was fulfilling Daniel 9.27. In the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Now, the 70th week was from AD 27 to uh, AD 34. After three and a half years of ministry, Christ died in AD 31. 30 or 31. There's always a distin uh, distinction about uh, whether it's 30 or 31. People sometimes have it wrong a little bit, and I just want to go here for a second into a very important point that, of course, in this regard you have to understand. Uh, God doesn't count in times of AD and BC or anything else. God counts from, from day one until the last day, from day one when he started creating this world until the last day, which will be the last day of this world before it is destructed, destroyed by him. Yeah, He doesn't count in AD and, and, and BC. So when we are sometimes saying, well, this was 27 AD or it was 26 AD or 28 AD or this, uh, Christ died in 30 or 31, you know, the point is uh, God counts in other terms. We just have to see that everything that we study here makes perfect sense and how far we understand it. And for future purposes, uh, you will see that it is important to understand that Christ died in 30 AD or 31 AD 
because it is very important what from that time frame on goes on because that time frame is still important today and that has to do with another prophecy of Daniel and that is something that Tom and I spoke about earlier on this broadcast in our upcoming study in the future to give a new uh, better understanding of the whole book of Revelation in view of Daniel of course because Daniel and the book of Revelation have to be understood together then it just makes sense and we are eradicating our mistakes in there and we are going to put studies out in the future where we will tell you where the whole world is deceived in that and that also has to do with here and there a year difference so whether it's 30 or 31 um, is, is important in a certain matter let me just uh, emphasize this just for one moment and then uh, Tom can take over and say his point about that um, when we understand that it was 30 AD that Jesus Christ went to the cross, it makes perfect sense that in 70 AD the temple was completely destroyed. 40 years later, the number 40 is here they're very important. It was not 39 or 41 years later, it was exactly 40 years later. The number 4 is in this regard very important all through the Bible. And that's why it sometimes is important to have your facts right. But therefore, you have to understand that God does not count in AD and BC terms. He counts from day one to the last day. That's what I just wanted to give as a little explanation here, Tom. I don't know if you have to add anything to it. Yes, the Bible plainly tells us that the man of sin thinks to change times and laws. And we don't go by God's calendar. We go by the papacy's calendar. It's called the Gregorian calendar. And uh, it, it uh, presumes to be a Christian calendar. And it marks uh, A.D. and B.C. as though it did deference to Christ. But in fact, uh, the calendar is designed to reject Christ. It's a papal calendar. It's not God's calendar. And the papal calendar can be manipulated. Okay? But we have the scripture. And the scripture says, and in the midst of the week, common sense tells you it's three and a half years, he shall cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. It's enough to know that from the beginning of the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy, three and a half years later, Jesus gave up his life, a sacrifice for many. And, and all, the other, and all the other dates are very easy, just confusing. And that's what, the, that's what Satan wants. That's what the Antichrist you, wants. You, you have, you have the, the so-called great work of Sir Robert Anderson who counts the days uh, from the going forth of the command. You've heard it all before. It's a lying load of hooey is what it is. It puts Jesus outside of the midst of the week, okay? It's just another way to deny that Jesus fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel. And, and, and every uh, a, a Bible prophecy expositor from, from John MacArthur all the way down they all laud and praise Sir Robert Anderson, who was nothing but a deceiver, a futurist, Jesuit-inspired deceiver. Okay? That's, what, that's the fame that they put behind their futurist delusion, is uh, the, 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 the Coming Prince by Sir Robert Anderson. And I'm here to tell you, it's a lying wonder. And don't you believe it. You better believe the scripture. And you know from the scripture that the 70th week of Daniel, when it began, three and a half years later, Jesus caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. If you get up, caught up into how many days or how many years they expired from the going forth of the command, you're going to be getting the, the teachings of men and their futurists. And they want you to believe a lie. So you ignore it and let the scriptures be your authority and no one will be able to deceive you. 
the greatest, the most powerful names, the most respected names in Protestant and evangelical churches laud Sir Robert Anderson and everyone like them because they're futurist in their beliefs. Don't you believe it? Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom, for this little add to what I said here. Now, again, in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease, the book of Daniel reads. The 70th week was from AD 27 to 34. After three and a half years of ministry, Christ died in AD 31, in the midst or middle of the week. At the moment of his death, the veil of the temple was rent, means torn, in twain, from the top to the bottom. As we can read in Matthew 27, 50, uh, 27 51, where it says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. This act of God signified that all animal sacrifices had at that moment ceased to be of value. Or, as Tom likes to say, all sacrifice came to a screeching end. Huh? The great sacrifice, the one and only by God accepted sacrifice, had been offered. Any thoughts here, Tom? Yes, when the Father offered the blood of his own Son to be a propitiation for sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, who in the world in his right mind would offer another sacrifice? And the greatest abomination of them all, the Roman Catholic Church, which created the mass and said that the priest of the Roman Catholic Church has the power to change the bread and the wine of, this, uh, of the, 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 the altar of the mass into a literal Jesus. His blood, his body, his soul, and divinity all wrapped up in that bread and that wine to be sacrificed again and again and again, perpetually as a perpetual sacrifice forever. That's what's taught in the Roman Catholic Church. Sacrifices every day. They crucify him afresh every day because it must needs that Jesus be crucified and sacrificed every day to pay for our sins. Certainly you don't believe that cockamamie baloney. Now you know why the Bible goes out of its way to say that Jesus caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. Now what do you automatically know? What is it that you automatically know once you know the truth. You walk into any church in this world, if they make a sacrifice, it's the synagogue of Satan. I don't care how pretty their hair is. I don't care how expensive and shiny their suit is. I don't care how many diamonds they wear on their fingers and around their neck. I don't care how fancy the cars or the how many jet airplanes they have in the hangar. I don't care how much it looks like God is blessing them with financial gain. It's the synagogue of Satan. If they make sacrifice, they have eaten and drunk damnation to themselves for rejecting the only sacrifice that can take away sins, that which Jesus made. 2,000 years ago in the middle of the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. You want to know if a church serves the living God? Just go there and sit there and wait and see if they make a sacrifice. 
Now, you ought to automatically know every Roman Catholic church anywhere in the world, whether it's Roman Catholic or Orthodox Catholic or uh, Coptic Catholic or any other kind of Catholic church, they all make sacrifices. That's what they champion the most. That's what they celebrate the most, the Mass, the sacrifice of the Mass. At that point, you don't need me, Yerk, or any man to tell you that it's the synagogue of Satan. You know it yourself. Likewise, if you go into a Baptist church, a Presbyterian church, a Methodist church, a Seventh-day Adventist church, any other church called Protestant or Evangelical, if they begin to, to liken the, 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 the communion service as a sacrifice, or if they call the bread and the wine a, a sacrament, you know they're on the primrose path to perdition. You know they're converting the, the table of the Lord into a diabolical sacrifice. They're, they're slowly but surely transforming the memorial called the communion table, the communion celebration in the Protestant evangelical churches to be just like the very spitting image of the mass of the Roman Catholic Church. And you're going to see it in every church without exception. This picture so I'm talks. telling you, if you still have fellowship in those churches, it's about to end. Back to you, Yerk. This picture, Tom, that you see here about uh, faith in the Old Testament and faith in the New Testament is actually completely proof of that because when you look at the picture it says that in the Old Testament people offered um, sacrifices in the form of uh, animals, goats, sheep, bulls, doves, whatever. In this picture, a sheep. Okay. What is the Roman Catholic Church but a continuation of that tradition? That's what it is. The Roman Catholic Church just holds up tradition, and she says so. The Roman Catholic Church even says of herself in writ that when it comes to interpreting the Bible, tradition supersedes the Bible. Now, what is thousands of years of animal sacrifice by the tradition that the Roman Catholic Church today in a quote-unquote unbloody sacrifice with the dogma of transubstantiation just continues to do as it was done in the Old Testament. There you can see the proof is in the pudding. That was the expression I was looking for. The proof is in the pudding. You see it right here. But the animal that was sacrificed, that was offered here, never ever took away any sin. It was the faith that that blood resembled the blood of Jesus Christ that made people righteous. And that's the same that we have today. By the faith that Jesus shed his blood on the cross, we are made righteous in him through his blood. God's way of salvation never changes. But that does not mean as the Roman Catholic Church takes it and interprets it. Well, if God used sacrifices in the Old Testament, he still uses sacrifices in the New Testament. No, that did not change, but that was fulfilled by Jesus Christ. And that's the point that they never talk about. That's the point nobody ever tells you. In all the churches that Tom just summed up, you will never hear that truth. And by that, you will never understand how deep the deception actually is. Please, Tom, if you want to continue. That's right. And this, this, uh, this image here shows that everyone before Christ, prior to Christ, uh, made animal sacrifices in typification of the Lamb of God, Jesus. And by faith, they, they made these sacrifices. Okay? And, and likewise, in our generation after Christ, we look back to Christ, and, uh, but we don't make sacrifice. You see, that's the difference between the left side of the, the image and the right. They made sacrifices prior to the cross. We make no sacrifice after the cross. 
you don't see a sacrifice there. And uh, that's a, a, a well thought out image to, to demonstrate the difference between the true church of Jesus Christ and the counterfeit church, the synagogue of Satan, where they make sacrifice. And uh, all the churches, all the Protestant and evangelical churches are conforming to Roman Catholicism. They're beginning to call the bread and wine of the communion table the sacraments, okay? They're beginning to refer to them as uh, uh, the transubstantiation. They're beginning to refer to them as the host or uh, uh, what's the word I want to use? Um, they want to call it uh, uh, the uh, sacrament of the mass, a sacrifice. It's no longer a memorial of what Jesus did. It's a recommitment of the of the sacrifice that Jesus made, a reenactment, a, a literal crucifixion. And uh, uh, the tables in, it will be c converted into altars, okay? This is all happening in the Protestant and evangelical churches. They're beginning to call the bread and the wine the Eucharist. That's the word I was trying to find earlier. When you start hearing your pastor refer to the communion table as an altar, when you begin to re hear him refer to the bread and the wine as the Eucharist, it's a done deal. It's already the synagogue of Satan, because at that point it becomes a sacrifice. It's no longer a memorial. It's an abomination before the Lord. And if you eat it and you drink it, you eat and drink damnation to yourself. You deny the sacrifice that Jesus made to make your own sacrifice. When Jesus said, and when Daniel said, he shall cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. Now you know why the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. To put an end, a permanent end, to animal sacrifices. And to make it stick, 40 years later, he used the Roman 10th Legion to raise that temple to the ground, not leaving one stone upon the other. Saving the Jews from eating and drinking damnation to themselves. He took that temple away so it could no longer be a stumbling block to the Jew. And if the 70 AD temple was a stumbling block to the Jew, guess what a 2022 temple would be on Temple Mount in Jerusalem? There isn't a Christian in this world that should have anything whatsoever to do with building a temple on Temple Mount in Jerusalem unless they want to see the Jews eat and drink damnation to themselves, unless they want to see the Jew reject the Lamb of God. And yet all the churches support the building of a temple and the resumption of animal sacrifices on Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Now do you see how corrupt the churches are? Do you still see the pastors in the same light that you did before? Or are you like me? You want to take them out with whips and chains. Okay. the great seal of the United States. And that great seal of the United States has on it Novus Order Seclorum, a new order for the centuries, for the ages, forever. So confident were that our founders and their idea about one generational responsibility one to the next, that they were confident that our country, that what they were putting forth would exist for the ages, for the ages. That was the challenge they gave us. That is the responsibility that we have. And for a couple of hundred years or more, that has always been the case. We're here today because we believe that, and we believe that the public policy that we put forth, the legislation we put forth to result in public policy 
that makes the future better. Uh, the Earth Summit Environmental Leadership Act, as this is known, presents us with an opportunity to follow up on the important work of the Earth Summit to develop its blueprint, Agenda 21, for envir global environmental action. His Holiness gave us a message of hope, peace, and dialogue. He challenged us to engage in dialogue, to move forward for the American people. Now watch this drive. Our enemies are innovative and resourceful. And so are we. They never stop thinking about new ways to harm our country and our people. And neither do we. His Holiness gave us a message of hope, peace, and dialogue. He challenged us to engage in dialogue. To move forward for the American people. If you've retired, you don't have anything to worry about. If you've retired, you don't have anything to worry about. If you've retired, you don't have anything to worry about. It's the third time I've said that. I'll probably say it three more times, see? In my line of work, you got to keep repeating things over and over and over again for the truth to sink in, to kind of catapult the propaganda.